Hey, what's going on? Welcome back to Iron Anchor Cycles, or outside Iron Anchor Cycles, I should say. Uh, hopefully you can see we got something a little bit different for you today. I'm about to hop in the truck, we've got the trailer hooked up, and I'm gonna go buy some bikes. Uh, I've got some new ideas, some new things I wanna do both for the shop and for the channel, and I'm excited to get started on it, and that's what we're doing today. So I'll explain more when we get back, hopefully with a couple bikes to take a look at, but we're inside the shop and it's nice and warm, and I can tell you what we're up to. So for the time being, I'm gonna get in the truck and get rolling, and uh, maybe we'll give you a little footage along the way and show you what we got and where we're going to grab some bikes, but uh, this should be exciting, so stick around. All right, well, just left my first stop. Got one bike in the trailer. There's the trailer. Not showing you the bike yet though. Uh, so I'm up in like wet Northwestern Massachusetts now. So I'm about to jump back over into New York and head kind of north of Albany. I'm gonna go look at a second bike and hopefully we'll be coming home with two. So I'll check back in with you after that. Hopefully we'll have two bikes in the trailer and we'll be headed back to the shop. So stick around, let's see how it goes. Okay, quick pit stop, had to get fuel. Couldn't resist getting one of these. I don't normally drink this crap, but whenever I'm on the road, I see a Cumberland Farms, these cherry icy slurpy things, can't resist them. So got it, back on the road. All right, well, that's bike number two. So now I got two diners loaded up, headed back to the shop. I'm pumped about both of these. It's gonna be a little different deal with each one, and I'm excited to tell you all about it. Uh, as soon as we get back to the shop, we'll get them unloaded, we'll take a look at the bikes, and I'll tell you what we're up to. So stick around, stay tuned. We got some fun coming up. All right, well, it's been a long day on the road, but I'm back and I'm pumped because I got bikes in the trailer. So let's pop it open, see what we got. Well, there they are. Probably can't see too much yet, but I'll get them pulled out, bring them in the shop. We'll show you what we got. All right, that was one, let's get number two. All right, so we've got these two bikes in here, sitting behind me, haven't even looked at them yet. Well, other than what I looked at when I picked them up. And we will get to talking about the bikes themselves and we'll go through them a little bit. But I did promise I was gonna explain when we got back to the shop uh, what I'm doing and what's going on here. So I'm gonna do that right now. So I mentioned at the beginning of the video that this is uh, sort of a new thing, both for the shop and for YouTube, for the channel. And I'm excited about both. So. I guess I'll start with the shop side, which is uh, you know, a little bit about us. I'm sure if you're a regular subscriber to the channel, uh, you kind of know what Iron Anchor Cycles is about. Uh, if you're new, first of all, make sure to get subscribed. Go ahead and do that. Uh, but also, uh, you probably don't know uh, who we are that well. Uh, so I'll explain it. Um, 
pretty simply, we're a Harley Speed Shop. Um, we've been working on customer bikes, doing upgrades, performance stuff, um, you know, really anything and everything. We do, you know, kind of service work, uh, tires and oil changes and all that good stuff too. Uh, but the majority of the business has been uh, customer work based. Obviously, uh, we do some project bikes that are on our, uh, for the shop or, you know, bikes that we, we've raffled, like the Purple Dyna, um, and that stuff's kind of come in between. But those have been things that have been sort of passion projects for me where I found a bike that I wanted to do a build on, uh, sort of like the Road King that we just did, that hopefully you all saw that build series on. I'll leave a link to that uh, if you haven't caught that. Um, but one of the things that's a challenge for us is that uh, the, the business, particularly here in the Northeast in New York where we are, business is very seasonal and very cyclical. So while we do have a busy season during the winter where we're doing you know, bigger projects for customers, uh, the, the, the bulk of our work that can be counted on reliably takes place in the spring. So it sort of starts in March and kind of rolls through the end of June into July, depending on the year. And then we kind of have a dead period every year. And I, you know, I get caught by surprise by it every year, but um, it happens every year. So I've decided we've got to do something about it where we get real slow, August, September, um, and now we're in October and things start to pick up a little bit where we'll get end of season things people want to get done before they put their bikes away. And we also start writing a lot of estimates and working on uh, planning for projects for the winter. But in terms of actual revenue and cash flow for the shop, uh, the end of the year uh, can be a little bit challenging. So um, I've been thinking about ways to augment the business and to try and do some new things. And one of the ideas I came up with is that we should, I don't want to say we're going to become a dealership exactly, uh, but we should start to sell some bikes. And certainly not in the sense of a traditional dealership, right, where we're going to be taking trades and kind of having a showroom full of bikes. Um, not like that. I would call it more akin to flipping bikes, where uh, I've been out sort of scouring uh, any place I can, marketplace, Craigslist, whatever, trying to find bikes that I think are cool and have potential but might be diamonds in the rough. Uh, that's been a thing of mine in the past of being able to find a bike that maybe other people didn't see the potential in and therefore you can get a deal on it, um, that we can kind of go through it, make some upgrades here and there and turn it into something that people will be able to more clearly see uh, the vision in and, and, and wanted to make a desire, make it a desirable bike. So that's what I did here. These are the first two bikes, uh, that I've bought in terms of trying to try this new plan out. So we are going to do some work on both of these. I have no idea how much yet. We'll talk about that when we get into the bikes, but ultimately I bought them to sell them. So I'm going to think strategically about what work makes sense to do and what work doesn't. I don't want to go crazy and spend $10,000, you know, outfitting these bikes because probably won't make our money back that way. So uh, I'm excited to see how this goes. So that's how this is new and what the new plan is for the shop. But when I say this is something new for the channel, uh, this opens up a whole new door of new content for us to do. I've gotten a little bit uh, maybe bored myself, maybe all you have too, I don't know, of just kind of doing the same thing. I mean, the how-tos and the installs and all that stuff, it's fun and it's cool, but I just need something new and I feel like this is a cool thing. So. We'll start to shoot some content around finding these bikes. We'll shoot some content around going to get them. Uh, we can do what we're gonna do now, which is kind of show you guys going through them, see what needs to be done. And ultimately we'll do a video on each bike and kind of packaging it. And uh, ultimately it'll wind up for sale. And obviously, you know, we won't, YouTube isn't exactly a listing marketplace for bikes, but we'll certainly uh, tell you all where to find them. And if you're interested in buying one of them, um, and I think what's great about this is, particularly when it comes to Dinas, which is mostly what I want to do because I love Dinas and they're still pretty easy to come by uh, and inexpensive. Um, but the great thing with Dinas is that, uh, particularly through social media, YouTube, Instagram, all that, there's a national market for these things and shipping bikes really isn't that expensive. So I think it'll be a really great opportunity to take these bikes that maybe I don't want to say we're headed for the junkyard. That's not what I mean. But bikes that were sort of maybe at the end of their life with their last owner. I mean, in particular, like this one, I'll talk more about it later. But, you know, this was owned by a retired guy who, uh, you know, got older and can't ride anymore. And so was selling the bike. And 
you know, that's sort of like the bike has, has lived a good life, um, but now we can kind of change things up on it, maybe modernize, customize a little bit, um, make it more of a, a young person's bike, if you will, and give it a whole new life with a new person. I don't want to say a new rider, but like a different, a new rider in terms of different, not new as an inexperienced, but somebody who can give it a whole new life. I mean, you know, the, obviously Harley's, you know, you know, these bikes are old by the standard of a car or whatever, but they're not. Do you know what I mean? A bike that's 20 years old, all you got to do is just service it, go through, do what needs to be done, and you can ride it another 20 years. I mean, they're so simple in that way. So uh, I think this is kind of a fun, exciting thing to do, and I'm hoping it works. I hope the YouTube content works and you all like it, um, and we can keep doing it, and I hope that we can keep finding bikes and I don't lose my shirt doing this, and we can, you know, pay the bills and keep the lights on here uh, in the times when we're not as busy doing customer work. So that's my plan and that's my hope. Um, I think that's probably enough of me just kind of talking about my plans. I, I can't imagine you're all that interested in it. Um, but I guess what I'll do now is we'll talk a little bit about the bikes. As a matter of fact, I've actually been driving all day. We went to uh, Massachusetts and then upstate New York and then back here to the shop. So um, it's been like a 10 hour day of driving for me. So I'm wiped. So I'm gonna go home, have dinner, and I'm gonna come back fresh tomorrow and we'll talk about the bikes. So for you, that's gonna be two seconds. For me, it'll be tomorrow morning, but I will see you then and we'll keep rolling. All right, well, it's the next day and I'm ready to start getting into these bikes. So let's take a look at this one first. What we've got here is a 2006 Lowrider. Now, if you're familiar with Dyna models over the years, uh, the Lowrider has kind of always been one of my favorites. And the reason for that is every model, uh, it's kind of the way Harley did things, was there's really no perfect bike. They kind of do it differently now, right? Where you look at like a Lowrider S, it's gonna have all the features of any of the particular models that exist, and they're all gonna be combined into one package. Back in the days of the Dyna, Harley didn't really do that. And each bike would have different things that you might want, but there was never really one bike that had everything. If you have the particular style that a lot of us do now, where the, the list of things that you want on every bike are mag wheels, mid controls, and black parts instead of chrome. Those are sort of the three kind of big things. Um, there are some other details, tank, gauges, things like that, but uh, we can add those onto the list maybe too. What's nice about the low riders is that a lot of them come with as many of those things as possible. Uh, missed one on the list, a big one, is the black motor as opposed to the blonde motor. We'll talk about that when we get to the super glide. Um, but this low rider uh, has obviously factory mag wheels, factory mid controls. It's got the dual gauges, which I really like. They're on the tank as opposed to on the handlebars, which some people like it one way or the other. I happen to like both a lot, um, but dual gauges is a big plus. And really the only drawback to me and my personal preferences on a low rider versus let's say like a street bob of a similar era is they do have a lot of chrome on them, which uh, is not usually my particular preference. So when I started looking for some bikes to buy, low riders were one of the bikes that I was looking for because I think they make really great platforms for doing customization and you know building a, a really fun bike out of. So, I came upon this one and we'll talk about the good and the bad. The good is kind of obviously a lot of the stuff that I mentioned. The other thing I really liked about this bike is perhaps you can tell by the style of it, this was owned by a retired guy who sort of you know aged out, uh, his health wasn't in great shape and had to sell the bike because couldn't ride anymore. Uh, so in that particular scenario, his loss of course uh, becomes our gain, which is that we get a bike that was exceptionally well taken care of, not beat up, no you know, burnouts and wheelies and you know, crazy things. You're not gonna find on this bike, I'm certain of it, any uh, you know, wiring cut and things jammed in the way they're supposed to be. This was a bike that was obviously really well taken care of. The mileage on it is a little higher than what I would normally like to see. It's like high 30s, I think, which is certainly not a big deal. I think, you know, until you get to 50 or 60,000 miles you, before you even have to start worrying about, you know, big rebuilds and things like that. So, you know, high 30s, I think it's like 38,000, really not a big deal. Um, would I like to see it lower? Sure, but given the fact that I know who owned the bike and that this was gonna be a lot of just easy riding. Um, I'm really not, not concerned about it. And I also know the bike was really well maintained. We got you know uh, service history and stuff like that. So all good news. 
So in terms of us buying it and what do we have to do with it, well, I haven't got it on the lift yet to know exactly what I'm gonna need to do. Uh, obviously, if we find any maintenance issues or you know repairs that need to be done, we'll take care of that. Check all the fluids, check the brakes, the tires, all that good stuff to make sure that you know when we go to sell this, it's you know ready to roll. But obviously, the, the more what I'm talking about uh, in terms of what we need to do is you know what does this bike need to be done, need to get done to it to make it uh, a cool bike, uh, essentially. So the first and I think most obvious thing here is, for lack of a better word, we need to de old guy this bike. Um, the chrome is gonna stay because it just works really well on this bike and also I'm not trying to pour a whole bunch of money into changing something that other people might like. But there are a lot of extra chrome accessories and little covers and all kinds of crazy things on here that just gotta go. There's also a ton of this live to ride, ride to live stuff on here. So you got it on the air cleaner, it's on the horn, it's on the derby cover. There's a little like a gold eagle here, cover, a chrome cover on the tail light, a chrome cover on the headlight. Um, all that stuff's gotta come off. So we're gonna replace all that trim with just, you know, kind of standard stuff. Um, I'm also going to take off, while saddlebags are nice, these are not the ones uh, that, that I would, you know, wanna have on here. So we're gonna take these saddlebags off. We're gonna take this Mustang seat off. We're just gonna put a standard Dyna seat on it. Um, you know, we'll see, I'll see what I got upstairs, honestly. We'll see what will go on this bike. We'll find something. Um, but we'll start to just clean it up and get it looking a little, a little lighter, a little trimmer, um, a little bit more like your typical Dyna. This windshield's also got to go, too. So we'll take all this stuff off. This will, you know, go into our spare parts uh, area. We'll use it for something maybe down the road. But this bike, I don't think, needs any of this stuff. Um, that's kind of number one. The... Other pieces that need to get done here, um, I'll give you a better angle to show you the, the, the only real big challenge on this bike. So these handlebars, this is, this is kind of a joke. Um, these bars are like this wide. They are, I don't even know, is this a beach bar? I don't know what the hell these are, but these bars gotta go. Um, I also think this is hysterical, this giant like clock here that's double-sided taped onto the riser clamp. That's just too funny. Um, but yeah, uh, the, these, these bars are definitely <clears throat> the weakest part of this whole bike. So uh, I'm going to be swapping the bars. Now, I don't want to go too crazy. Um, number one, with spending a whole bunch of money on like what I think this bike should have is chrome thrashing risers. Um, I think it would be the perfect uh, uh, look and feel for this bike. Um, it's just too expensive for me to put into a bike that I don't know, you know, what size people are gonna want and whatever. We'll do something to get it set up that somebody could change it later if they wanted. But uh, the bigger thing is this bike has already had all the lines and cables changed to braided stainless lines. And because these are really nice and expensive, I don't wanna take them off and I don't wanna change them. So we are gonna be a little bit limited in terms of what height I can put on because I don't wanna change the lines and cables. Um, the wiring, I don't care about. We'll extend that if we have to, but I really don't wanna do the lines and cables. Now, what works out for us is that because these bars are so wide, uh, they do have longer lines and cables that you might find on like a shorter or more narrow bar at this height. So what I'm hoping is, is we can sacrifice some width and gain some height out of it and get that, move that hand position from here to something like this. So I'm gonna do a little bit of measuring and see what we can do in terms of a bar and riser combination. Now, that leads us to um, one of the really only kind of flaws in this early generation of low rider. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more and I'm gonna show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so while I did mention that I do love the dual gauges on the tank, the problem with this generation of low riders as opposed to the next generation, which are the like 2014, 15, 16, 17, those very last models, which are honestly perfect bikes. Uh, those even came with dual disc front ends for what it's worth. This is just a single, but uh, on these early ones, you have the indicator lights. So this is your turn signals, uh, high beam, oil pressure light, neutral indicator up here on the riser, which from a factory perspective, it's, it's kind of cool that they're up here. It's, it's, a, it's a nice compromise of having the gauges down here and this up here. The problem with it is obviously, it should, it should be screaming at you right now, is if you want to change these risers, you more or less can't 
because you got to figure out something to do with this. And you know, people struggled with that, and you wind up kind of leaving these risers in place and putting you know different bars on and whatever. And um, I really would like to change the riser out because I just don't like the way this looks. Um, this one one option is this isn't a terrible riser. It's probably about I don't know four inches, maybe a little bit more, and it's got pullback in it, which is nice. Um, I don't hate the riser. We could just leave this exactly as it is and just put a bar on and maybe we'll do that. But I would really like to have, I'll make the effort to get rid of the riser and find something to do with this so that the next owner uh, can put whatever size riser they want on if they wanna go taller and change these lines. So there are a couple of options that, that, that can be done. Number one is, there are really, at least as far as I'm aware, for this small self-contained indicator light setup, there is, as far as I know, no aftermarket uh, like other kinds of riser top clamps that will accept this. There are riser top clamps that will accept the older style or sportster style, where the lights are all kind of individual and it's, it's a little bit wider. Um, so one option is, and I've done this on other bikes, is swap this out, rewire it for the older style lights that you can then put into a standard top clamp or you can move the gauges up and do it with the gauges. And actually, you'll be able to see it exactly what I'm talking about when I show you the red bike because it has those indicator lights on it with the bar mounted gauges. But uh, before we get there, the other option, which I'm kind of thinking about doing because I think it might be the coolest solution is to take this out of here and stick it right in here between the gauges. Um, it's not, it's obviously not gonna look factory. It's not gonna be, um, you know, you're gonna know that it was moved there, but it really does, uh, I think, solve the problem. And so, you know, there's not a ton of room here because you have the, the gauges, but obviously if you look at this, the gauges will, you know, kind of hang over this plastic trim a little bit, which is why it's not gonna look 100% factory. But the actual screen here, if you will, with the lights on it, will fit, if you get your measurements correctly, right in here in between the gauges, and you'll be able to have all your indicators down here. And then once that's gone, we can put any bar and riser combo we want on here, and I think that might be the solution. So I'm gonna do one of those three things, either leave the riser, rewire this to something else or move the indicators down here. Maybe, I don't know, let me know in the comments if you've got an idea of what you think might be the, the best of those three options. Um, obviously, I'm not trying to spend a fortune and the, the cheapest solution is just to leave everything alone. Um, and then the next cheapest solution would be probably to move this here because it's not gonna really cost any money, just some time of having to you know, uh, cut this out. Uh, and then obviously the most expensive solution is um, rewiring this and having to buy those parts from, from Harley and whatever. Um, obviously, I, I didn't say it, but moving this from here to here, obviously there's no cost in, in moving this, but then you gotta buy a set of risers, so there's cost there. Um, so sort of one, two, three options there. But anyway, um, let's, I'll give you a quick walk around of the bike, I'll show you kind of the rest of it, and then um, we'll talk about the red bike. All right, so like I said, this bike is, a little dirty, dirty from sitting in somebody's garage, but it is really clean. There's not a scratch, a mark, anything like that on it. No oil leaks or evidence of that. Um, it's, it's just in really good shape. So like I said, I'm um, gonna de-old guyify it, get those enormous bars off of there, uh, get some of these you know, gold trim pieces off of here. And then the last thing is, I might wanna put some taller shocks on this bike. It really, to me, looks like, uh, you know, Obviously, you know, you can, you can imagine taller shocks yourself, but I think seeing it with taller shocks, I think would help uh, to give this bike the look and the stance that we're going for. So might, might add that onto the list. Obviously that eats into the margins of trying to sell the bike, but I do think, I do think it might be worth it. So in any event, that's the 06 Lowrider and uh, let's move on and talk about the red bike. All right, so let's talk about the red bike. So this one is maybe a little bit more of a complicated story uh, in terms of getting it. Um, I was, like I mentioned earlier, I was looking for low riders and for whatever reason, I kind of thought that's what this was gonna be. Um, I didn't really look at the listing that carefully and I saw the laced wheels, which is, is what came on the earlier generation of twin cam low riders. Um, really thought that the motor looked black and not uh, blonde like this one. 
Um, but just didn't look at the photos carefully. I saw the uh, fuel gauge and, and gas cap here kind of far away. They looked like gauges. Didn't notice the gauges up here. I'm just an idiot, honestly. Uh, so when I got there and realized that this was actually a super glide, um, which is most notably uh, noticed by the color of the motor, the gray or blonde motor, uh, I was a little bit bummed because I wasn't really looking for a super glide because although I actually think there's a ton of potential in these uh, gray motor bikes, if you know anything about my uh, early Dyna, and I will put a link up to the uh, video where we did a story on that bike, it's a gray motor bike that kind of was a dog when it first, uh, in its first iteration, it was not a cool bike and turned it into something really cool. Um, although that's me, a lot of people kind of stay away from these, so I wasn't really trying to buy one, but uh, honestly, when I got there, I kind of liked the bike. It was cheap. I got a really good deal on it. Uh, and the other piece of it, and this is a bad business decision, but uh, I liked the, the kid and his buddy that were selling it. Um, it reminded me of, you know, myself like 15 years ago, um, you know, trying to trade up to the next thing and, you know, learn about Harleys and whatever. So I don't know. I was already all the way up there. I had bought the other bike. They were kind of nearby. One was up in Massachusetts. This one was up north of Albany. Um, I just said, you know what, it's not that much money, I'm gonna roll the dice and we'll see what we can do with it. So I've been thinking about it since yesterday about what the potential is here and ultimately what led me to buy it, which I'm not gonna lie, is what leads me to buy most of the Harleys that I buy, is the paint. Um, I'm just a sucker for factory paint, certain factory paint. Um, and this deep, uh, it's almost like a cherry wine red, I love it. There's a lot of red colors that Harley has done that I hate. The like really bright, like fire engine, that kind of thing doesn't do it for me. But these deeper, uh, you know, kind of, like I said, cherry, wine, whatever you want to call it, I love, I love these colors that Harley has done. So I see some potential in this bike. Now, there's some things that we're definitely going to have to go through on this bike, and there's going to be a lot more work to be done on this bike to get it into something that I'd be comfortable selling uh, as a bike sort of, you know, with, with my name on it, with the shop's name on it. Um, you know, different if you're just sort of saying, hey, I, you know, I found this bike. I haven't gone through it. I'm just trying to move it on down the road. You know what I mean? That's kind of buyer beware. Take what you get. But if we're going to go through this and I'm going to put my name on it, it's got to be a good bike and it's got to be a cool bike. So, uh a bunch of stuff to be done, but before I start talking about all of that, there is one major thing that I have to look at first before we do anything else, and I actually have not even started this bike since uh, the title got signed because I don't want to do any damage to it once I owned it, which is we have to look at the cam chain tensioners. So this bike has 20-something thousand miles on it, which is a perfect amount for a bike of this age. You know, a super low mile bike can be, a, as, it can honestly be a worse thing than a high mile bike. This bike's definitely um, been ridden, it's been used, uh, but it's not used or used up, um, I should say. But uh, the owner did not know whether the cam chain tensioners had ever been checked or done, and so we are gonna absolutely, like I said, not even gonna start this bike again, we're gonna roll it up on the lift, we're gonna pull the cam cover off and we're gonna take a look at those tensioners because I wanna see what shape they're in. And that is gonna determine what we're gonna do with this bike because if the, ten if the chain tensioners are still great, if they still have a lot of meat on them and there's no reason to do anything in there, I'm gonna close that back up and we're just gonna to get to having a little bit of fun with cleaning the bike up, fixing some stuff and we'll talk about that. But if those tensioners are worn out, they need to be changed and which is very likely I'm gonna to have to rethink our direction a little bit. We might have to do some more work. Now, pretty inexpensively, I could just put some new mechanical tensioners in, um, but for the same reason I advise customers against doing it, I don't wanna do it. It's a ton of work, and all you get is, you know, kind of a repair of something that was gonna be a problem anyway. If those tensioners need to be done, I think I'm gonna wind up putting a fueling uh, conversion cam chest in there along with 525 cams. So it'll turn this bike into something that's not just kind of like a you know cool you know uh, first year twin cam. It'll turn it into something that's got you know some some power to it. It'll bring the, it'll put us in a different price bracket in terms of where I'm trying to sell the bike. Um, it'll make it more expensive. Truthfully, I mean that kit is a couple thousand dollars. So if we're gonna do it, then we're gonna have to turn the bike into into something else. And I don't know. I don't even know if I can sell the bike for what it's worth. If I have to do that, we might wind up having to raffle it, um, which would be cool too, honestly, because it would be as raffles go, it would be a cheap one. But um, in any event. 
that's the thing we have to have to have to check uh, because I just, I don't know. I don't know what condition it's in. That aside, the other stuff that I wanna do on this bike, I've made a list, I should have got it, but um, number one is, you know, it's got a decent looking bar and riser set up on here, um, but the bars are chewed up, the riser's chrome, I think it should be black, um, but the bigger thing is, this bike had at one point taller risers on it. You can see, maybe you can and you can the camera. It's got externally wired bars, which I hate, so I wanna change that. The brake line has this big, uh, you know, extra loop in it, as does the clutch, so, and the throttle and idle cables. So very easily we could do a taller set of risers and bars on here and get them internally wired. It's a lot of labor on these early bikes with all these fucking wires, but, um, we're gonna do it, because I think it's just gonna make this bike look a thousand times better. So I actually have a set of bars and risers. They were on, uh, if you remember the video we did on the, the last Dyna I built, which was the 04 DX. I'd put a set of Bunking risers and uh, Big Al's bars on there. Uh, those wound up coming off in place of some Kraus stuff for the person who wound up buying the bike. So I have those bar and risers sitting on the shelf. So I think I'm gonna use them again and put them on this bike. Uh, I don't think, I'm hoping that they are, that the wiring and lines and cables and stuff will accommodate uh, those bar and that bar and riser height. Um, the same time I do that, I'm gonna get rid of these giant old school turn signals. Um, if I have a cooler set of mirrors to put on, I'll do that. If I don't, I'm gonna leave these. I'm not gonna spend a couple hundred bucks just to change mirrors. Somebody else can do that. Um, we'll get these gauges relocated and moved. I don't, I don't like these kind of standoffs that are on here on top of the headlight. I'd rather have them up on the bars. That's just my personal preference. So uh, it's a pain to, to wire these, but we're gonna do it because I think it's worth it. Um, other than that, uh, I should have mentioned this stuff right off the bat. Um, the downside of this bike is supposed to be a super glide. The, the trade-offs are a super glide comes with, a, with the gray motor, which some people don't like, but it does come with mids and mags. That's the upside of a super glide. So even I didn't want to buy a super glide. I didn't even buy one that's got the right parts on it. <laughs> so it's got forwards put on it and somebody took the mags off and put laced wheels on it. Um, I'm, I could be wrong about the wheels. These could be original. I know uh, like 2000s super glides all came with mags on them. The, not the super glide customs, but the super glide standard uh, came with mags. The 99, this being the first year, it may have come with laced wheels. I don't think it did. I could be wrong. If you know better, you can leave a comment and let me know, but um, I think this bike would have come with mags on it. So I have to find a set of mags to put on here. That's gonna be the most, of everything we do on this bike, the wheels are gonna be the most expensive thing, um, unfortunately, but it is what it is. Um, when I think about the cost, the price I paid for this bike, and I add in the price of mid controls and mags, that is about what I would have paid for a bike that had those things. So I don't think I'm, I'm behind the eight ball because of that stuff. It just means the margins are getting really narrow and there's not much else I can do. So that's why using a set of bar and risers that I have on the shelf, that doesn't cost me anything. So we're good there. The uh, one other thing that I really want to do, um, in addition to some little details, right? There's battery covers missing here, so we have to replace that. Um, the fuse cover, electrical cover on the other side is missing as well, so we have to replace that. Um, the other, like I said, the big thing that I would really like to do is particularly if we do the cam chest, but even if we don't do the cam chest, I'd like to put a nice pipe on here. I think a black two into one pipe on this would just look great. Um, if Thunderheader has pipes in stock, I might buy one of those. If not, I know I can get a Bassani quickly, so you know maybe we'll go that route, but um, I really think I'd like this one in particular to be, to really have the look of a Dyna that I think just has the really, the right aesthetic. Um, the only thing I'm not gonna do that I would recommend the next owner do first off right away is the shocks. I would do, particularly on a bike like this, a set of like 14 inch Legends or something like that. That would be the first thing that I would do, but we're just running out of budget. So I'd rather do the pipe than the shocks. So that's gonna be that. Um, that said, I think that's the initial walk around on these two bikes. Uh, next thing is going to be to get one of these up onto the lift and start going through them. So that's what we're going to do. All 
All right, well, I guess we're starting with the 06. As much as I'm looking forward to getting in that cam chest, uh, there's a lot more work to do on that bike, and this one I think is gonna be a little bit easier, so I kinda just wanted to start here and, uh, I don't know, just see what we can do just really quickly uh, to kinda get this bike looking like I think it can. Uh, and I said the first thing we were gonna do was start pulling some parts off of here. So I think I'm gonna start by just getting rid of some of the things that I know I don't want on here. And then, uh, I don't know, we'll jump into maybe measuring and seeing what I can do for the bars. Uh, I'm gonna obviously need to at this point go through everything too and kind of see what shape it's in. But uh, I'm gonna start by just pulling some of this stuff, stuff off. So let's do that. This bike's got some potential. So hopefully you can see what I was talking about here. Um, while I didn't wanna spend the money on doing shocks on the other bike, cause it doesn't need it quite as much. That bike's got uh, shocks that are a little taller than this one does. These are short. These are, I measured them eye to eye. They're sitting at a little, they're like 11 and a half inches. So they're 12 inch shocks. Um, this, this tire just looks stuffed in here. We gotta get this up in the back, get this looking like a Dyna should look. So shocks are gonna be on the list. We're gonna put taller shocks on here. So I gotta figure out which ones, see if I have anything, um, but definitely we gotta do shocks. So we'll spend the money on a pipe on the other bike. We'll spend the money on the shocks on this. And we'll leave the pipes alone. So those are the trade-offs you gotta make. Obviously if a bike was for me, I would do it all, but can't do everything. So let's see, I got that stuff off. Um, I don't know, this bike's a little dirty, so maybe I'll just sort of start wiping things down and as I go through everything with a rag, I'll start to find some of the things I need to look closer at. So I'm gonna maybe start to go through that a little bit and then I'll come back, give a little update. All right, with just a little bit of elbow grease and a couple of wrenches turned, I've got this bike looking a lot more like I hoped it would and thought it could. Um, you know, I got a bunch of little chrome trim and covers taken off like, there were the ones over the headlights I mentioned. This was covering the voltage regulator. This was over the plastic uh, lower belt guard. Um, you know, I talk about, and I wanna be clear, you know, I say, oh, go get rid of all the chrome stuff. It's the chrome doodads that I, that I just can't stand. So I don't mind chrome engine covers, you know, things like that. It can look really good and really classic and traditional on a Harley. What really gets me though, is the useless chrome that's, you know, bolted on or, you know, taped on or whatever over the functional covers underneath. It just makes me nuts. So I got rid of most of it on this bike. I, there's a little bit more like up here is a great example you see all the time. This is not a chrome master cylinder. This is a chrome cover that's placed over the master cylinder reservoir. Um, so you can get corrosion in there, you know, it, it, it's not doing you any favors. And to me, it also just looks hokey to be adding on covers like that. So. Um, I try to remove as much of that as possible. So anyway, um, got all that stuff off. I also took off, and I was on the fence about this, um, this little chin spoiler. So I hate these, I think they look stupid, um, but obviously this is paint match to the bike. So I'm gonna include this with the bike for whoever buys it. I just think they look bad. And they also do a really great job of trapping grime and grit and oil from oil changes all up in here and making a huge mess. So um, I think they look dumb and I also think they uh, are functionally have a negative impact on the bike. So off it came. Uh, speaking of grime and whatever, I did wipe off the whole bike and you know, it, it was a little dirty, you know, garage dust and whatever, but really I couldn't find a scratch or a ding or a dent or rust on it. The only place that had any uh, issue whatsoever was under that chin spoiler, there was just about a quarter inch of just grime all over everything from stuff getting trapped from getting kicked up off the front tire and you know oil and stuff getting trapped from changing the oil filter. So uh, the bike is in exceptionally good shape from what I have found so far. So I'm really pleased about that. Um, what else? So where I am right now is I've got a jack under here and the bike is jacked up a little bit. I've got the rear tire touching the workbench but the weight taken off of it. So these shocks do measure out at 12 inches. And you can see it looks a little bit better, but um, a set of 13 inch shocks would be great. 14s I think would be perfect. Um, I'm just gonna see what I've got and you know, we'll put something on here that's gonna work better than these. Uh, at the same time, there's something interesting here, which is 
There's a little, you're not gonna be able to see it in this camera angle, but there's a mount back here that I originally thought was for the saddlebags I took off, but those saddlebags don't connect to this bracket. They just go right onto the docking points here. So these have two mounting points on them. One is for a sissy bar and one is for the saddlebags. Um, we'll leave these in place, you know, if anyone wants to, you know, do something with them. But um, this one back here is obviously for something that I didn't get with the bike for some other accessory. Um, and that you could just leave alone. However, I happen to have, because we don't throw stuff away because we're all hoarders, um, these are the original uh, shock mount uh, bolts for a late model Dyna that came off another bike. I'm gonna swap these on in place of these, of these brackets, just to clean it up. The other thing is these are actually stick out further and are wider to make room between the shock and the fender for whatever this thing was. So there's also an additional spacer down here to compensate to have the uh, shock move out this way as well. Um, so I don't know, like I said, what this was for, but it's definitely um, something we don't have. So uh, I gotta take the shocks off anyway to change them. So might as well just go the extra step um, and just swap them for uh, these guys. And then we'll be able to uh, just have it be as original as possible, so all good. Um, what I kind of want to do actually is, even before we look for shocks or order anything if I have to, um, kind of want to just unbolt these, maybe just do this change right now and jack the bike up to where it would sit either with a 13 or 14 inch shock and kind of kind of kind of look at the stance and height of the bike and see what's going to make more sense. Um, Cause I know, I mean, there's a lot of 13 inch shocks out there. Like I know I could find some used ones and just throw them on like, you know, Legend Revos or something. Um, but 14s, like, I know you can buy them used, but uh, I can get them from Legend for as good as a used price. So uh, I'll have to buy those new, uh, spend a little bit more money, but we'll see what's gonna, what's gonna look better. Um, obviously 14s would be the way I would go. Um, I also like two over front ends, but obviously that's not for everybody. So uh, 13 might be the happy compromise, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so I'm gonna mess around with this a little bit right now, and then I'll show you kind of where I come, what I come up with for a rear height. And then we're gonna go up to these bars and figure out what I'm gonna do here. Um, I'm really on the fence. I don't know, uh, I don't know what, the right, what the right plan of attack is. So uh, we will, we'll see. Okay, so before I get going on this stuff, um, I just noticed from this camera angle, you can really see how <laughs> absurd these handlebars are. Um, anyway, I just thought I'd point that out. It's, it's, it's really something. Um, but anyway, let's, uh, let's get rolling here. Okay, so hopefully you can see what I'm talking about here now. This bracket, obviously not original. This was probably to mount a different set of saddlebags that the customer used to have on there. Uh, customer, I'm the customer, that the previous owner used to have on there. Um, and obviously they were just, you know, didn't want to go through the time to, to remove them and put the old stuff back on. So, um, and then there's the spacer uh, included in the bottom. So let me grab the OE ones, I'll show you the difference. So that compared to that, you can see that there is, they're not the same. This pushes the shock further out. So uh, no big deal. We'll just replace these. And uh, once we do that, and actually, eh, I don't know. These might not be correct. Although, you know what? I think they are. I do think they are correct. But anyway, I'll figure it out. Um, I have another set somewhere too. But um, yeah, let's get the other one fully removed. I'm gonna raise the bike up a little bit. We'll kind of, we'll see what we're working with. Okay, so I uh, got the shocks off and did discover that these, which I thought were gonna be the right part for this, are actually not. Uh, I went to the parts book and took a look and it turns out that these are, as I was aware, the correct shock um, bolts. I mean, they're kind of more complicated than a bolt, but the correct shock mounts for a late model Dyna. I assumed that went all the way back to 06, but it actually doesn't. These changed, these became the part in 08. So the 08 through 17s use these. The 06s and 07s are different. Um, the 0405s are also obviously different because those, that was the previous frame, but this being the first generation of the new frame, you know how it is, Harley makes little changes along the way. Um, so on the newest bikes, these holes are not threaded and there's a hexagon like, you know, broached in there or whatever. 
that holds the little hex on here. So this slides through, locks into place this hex, and you tighten it down with this nut. These holes are actually threaded, and I looked in the parts book, and basically what, the, what these bikes, the 06s and 07s used, was just a long bolt and a uh, free spacer. So the bolt threads into here, just like the bolts on the, those mounts I took off do. Um, but fortunately, I happen to have a set of these, and I'm pretty sure these are from RWD. They're their shock mount bolts, and these were used on, I can't remember what bike, some project we did, and we took them off and swapped them for something else. Um, but these spacers are gonna be the right size. So we'll be able to use, and these bolts are, I don't know if they're the same, well, not these bolts, but the bolts that came out of the shock, I'm not sure if they're the same length as these, but we obviously don't need these nuts either. So we'll use the original bolts that came off, we'll use this spacer, no spacer at the bottom, and we'll be good to go. These shocks will bolt back on. Uh, when we go to put on the new shocks, we'll obviously have to add in whatever spacers come with them, but we'll be set up for whatever shock we want to run. We'll be able to use them with these spacers that'll mimic the factory ones, essentially. So what would life be without a couple of small challenges when doing this stuff? So that's no big deal, overcome. Um, now looking at this, this might look a little different to you. I did actually jack the bike up a little bit. So where we're sitting distance-wise from eye to eye now is it, wa it was, um, well, originally it was at 11 and a half inches. Then when I jacked it up and took the weight off, it was at 12 inches. Now I have it sitting at 12 and a half inches. So what this is reflective of is the height the bike would sit at when it's, on its under its own weight on the ground with 13 inch shocks. Now, I think it looks a heck of a lot better than it did. That extra one inch makes all the difference in the world. Um, you get a better line around the tire here. It's not, doesn't look squished like it did before. Um, I still think 14s with a 13 and a half inch uh, uh, height, obviously it'll, it'll drop another half inch when you get on it, but um, if the preload is set correctly. Um, I think that would look better, but I guess what I'm realizing here is if all I can get is 13s or if I can get a better deal on a set of 13s, it would still be an improvement over what we have. Plus obviously we'll get a better shock than the factory ones. So that's kind of what I'm thinking for here. But for now, I think what I'm gonna do is just bolt these shocks back on. I'll drop this back down, uh, put these shocks back on uh, with the new spacers uh, and the spacers removed from the bottom just so we can get that checked off. Uh, and then we'll maybe uh, move over to the bars and see what's going on there. All right, so these are the bars we're gonna be running on here. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, if you couldn't... <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't shoot when there's other people around. Um, so what I did here was obviously take the giant beach bars off and I use these bars. These are actually off of a, like a Lowrider ST um, or Lowrider S, like an M8 bike. Um, but they're roughly the same shape as what like a regular kind of tracker, like low, mid or high bend bar would be. So I wanted to put these on to get a sense of how much additional slack we'd get in the cables by moving from the wide to the narrow. So instead of going out, we'll be able to go up. And what we have here in terms of total height on this is about eight inches. So it's roughly four inches in the riser and roughly four inches in the bar. Um, and I was shocked to find out how much slack we actually have in these cables now. So if you look at the clutch, we've got about four more inches that we can go up here. And then it's more or less the same thing on the brake side. So if you see, that's well, gonna be hard on the camera angle, but take my word for it, it's pretty, it's pretty high. Um, I didn't, I mean, I did hold the throttle and idle cables up to check, but honestly, if I have to change those, I'm not gonna sacrifice all this for a throttle and idle cable. I'll replace those if I have to, but I don't think I'm going to, I think it's gonna work. Um, so what that means is, is we can do basically up to a 12 inch T-bar setup. I, Love 12 inch, 12 inch bars on a Dyna are my, that's my number. Um, any bike I build for myself, it's 12 inches. With pullback, 12 inches, that's my thing. Um, I'm 6'2", and I'm a little taller than a lot of people, so it's probably a reasonable thing to consider that this bike is not for me, and maybe doing a 10 inch bar, or 20, 10 inch total height might be better. Um, so I think that's what we're gonna shoot for. I actually, ironically, the other bike over there uh, we are changing out the bars and risers on that, but it has like a brand new looking chrome six inch pullback riser that'll work perfectly on this bike. So won't even have to spend any money there. So um, I'm gonna take that riser, use it here, and then we'll get a set of probably thrashing bars 
um, mid bends to get to about 10 inches total. But the beauty of this, and of course I will point this out to whoever buys this bike is, if you want to go to 12 inches, all you have to do is take that riser out. All, you know, the bars and everything are all done all, and all your lines and cables are gonna be long enough. All you gotta do is just, you know, pull the wiring out, pull the bars out, put a different riser on and put it back on. I actually just did a riser change for a customer this week. It literally took me less than an hour to change the risers out, just go swap, swap. Like it was, it was that fast. Um, so I think that's awesome. The other piece is too, and I mentioned this earlier that if this bike was for me, I'd be putting a nicer looking riser on, but I don't wanna spend $600 or whatever it is on a riser that might not be what a customer ultimately wants. So we'll put something inexpensive on, almost as like a, it's functional, but as a placeholder. And then when this is your bike, you can decide, you know, which billet five, $600 riser you wanna put on, but all the hard work of the lines and cables is already done and it's at the right height and it's gonna be awesome. So I'm jazzed on that. So. Uh, we're more or less at a stopping point here. I think I've got just about everything figured out that needs to be figured out on this bike. So the only other thing I gotta do is figure out how I'm gonna move the uh, indicator lights, like I mentioned. Definitely now seeing this uh, with this riser here. I mentioned there were three options, one of which was leaving the riser. That option is off the table. This just looks so stupid. I don't know what it is about the shape of this or the fact that it's polished and not chrome, but it's half chrome and half polished. I don't, I don't, or I don't know what it is, but it looks awful. So um, this, this is gonna go. So I think what I'm gonna wind up doing is, assuming I can do it nicely, is move the indicators down into the console. Obviously the other option still exists to change this out to the other style and, and get a top clamp that'll work with it. But I kind of like the idea of just moving it into the console. So um, that's kind of the last thing I've got to do before we uh, order what we need and get this bike built. And we'll do a new video on this bike, finishing it, kind of doing the setup on it that we're gonna do. And I'll do another video also on digging into the red bike. So actually, this is probably the end for this video. Um, I, I, don't, I wasn't sure how much more we were gonna shoot, but I think I covered what I wanted to cover, which was explaining to you guys like what the new plan was, taking you on a little trip to go buy some bikes, uh, showing them all to you, and starting to dig into this one. So hopefully you get a sense of uh, what some of this content's gonna be like going forward. So if you're digging it, please let me know, it's helpful. Um, you know, leave a comment, be like, yup, love this, or no, this is stupid. Like, go back to doing, you know, motor jobs on customer bikes, I don't know. Tell me whatever you think, it, it's, it's fine. I might not listen to you, but maybe I will. Um, but yeah, I guess that's gonna do it. So we'll see you on the next video and uh, thanks for watching.